Hello. Come right on in. You're it, Father Fish. Nice to have you with us. Somebody just came up. There he is. Hey, boys and girls. Guess who's come to visit? Ta-da. Hi hey there. there. Nice to see you. How's it going? Good. You're smiling. smiling. I'm smiling. <laughs> Good for you. Keep smiling. You smile through the pain. Yeah. The <laughs> you know, after a while, every every day really is a good day. I agree with you that these are some good times, but it, it it's just every day is a good day. when When you've been through hard times, you know, you realize that Every, you'll get over little things like physical pain. Right. I'll tell you, I, I adopted the philosophy some years ago that until you are in some very real way broken, you really don't know much about life. Agreed. Yeah. So what do we want to talk about this morning? Well, I don't know. Um, Mary Page said you had a couple of new videos, and that, and that in one of them you were talking about the the effect of the fires on the hobby, and that's it. That sounded kind of interesting. What, what's your yeah. take on that? Well, my take is that the you know actually there was a new article this morning since I even published the video, and. Uh, it was talking about the Pantanal down in Brazil. Yeah. And and um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, okay. Um, and they were talking about how um, a lot of, you know, jaguars and deer and all sorts of, like, large apex animals were um, dying of thirst because oh. the water had become caustic from all the ash. Huh. And so, so it was killing fish, too. Um obviously, but, uh, basically, I mean, we need fire. It, it renews everything, but the fires that we're seeing now in areas that have seen clear cutting or that are started with, um, gasoline and, and things like, um, they'll use thermite and gasoline, but they'll, they'll use really hot burning things to start the fire. And it'll actually burn the the earth below in the rainforests. It burns underground too for sometimes like several years, uh, and it smolders. But because of that, it, it's not the same kind of fire that you'd get naturally from lightning or something, because those fires would quickly burn through the underbrush and produce enough, uh, you know, various elements that we need like carbon and um, phosphorus and nitrogen all sorts of things that go up into the atmosphere or come down as ash or charcoal things like that um, and now though with some of these fires like in California and things too in in America uh, in the states you see hillsides and things losing their integrity and so you see mudslides and um, things like that. And we've seen, uh, in, in Washington state, there was some studies done about salmon and the year of a fire, the salmon population was decimated almost 80% on, uh, the, uh, Yakima river. But after that, the following five years were the best years they'd seen in 40 years, because, uh, I guess it, it made enough algae nutrients for the, the baby fry to grow really fast and really strong. So that extra nutrients in the water really helped. It was just, it's hard for the ecosystem to withstand the hot fires that are artificially burning, so to speak, when we leave a lot of underbrush and don't let small fires burn annually like they would from lightning naturally. Yeah, that's exactly right. In Florida, they finally, after years of, of bad forestry practices, for the last 20 years or so, they've adopted the policy of regular annual burns, which burns out all the low undergrowth and does not damage trees and does not damage the soil. If the fire moves very quickly, it's there and gone. It's simply 
it's burning grass and weeds, low brush, um, does not build up the heat that that a, a deep brush fire will. If the the policy that has caused a lot of this <clears throat> is one that has 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 been a policy to put out every fire, to not allow fires to burn, to not allow that underbrush to be burned out. And it builds up year after year and reaches the point where it becomes a conflagration. It becomes yeah. a fire so massive that it cannot be put out. So hopefully, hopefully there's a lesson learned here. Um, th this has got more to do, I think, with, with bad practices than it does with environmental issues. And if the bad practices are corrected, then we can correct for environmental issues. But if we keep doing bad practices, we'll never get control of it. Yeah, well, I think it's also valuable to just see what Native people did in different parts of the world. I mean, Amen. the Native the Native Americans, the Native Brazilians, and the Na Native Aborigines all, like, well understood fire and using it every year. So Sure, that's right. Yeah, rather than clear cut, they did clear burn. And they would do mm -hmm. they would do a burn in the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the way gardening started. It started by planting in planting in burned over areas, uh, yeah. which was just the highest level of nutrition. That's what we do in our fish tanks. You know, we burn everything off. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's really what I'm doing in mine. I'm putting in the kind of products that are created in fires. The kind of uh, products that are <coughs> organic materials that are broken down, uh, and, and put them in, and and allow them to be not in the water column, because that's a big mistake people make. They they mm -hmm. put the dirt in and they put water in, and and all of those nutrients are instantly in the water column, and so you got all kind of algae blooms. You got mis discolored water. You got all kinds of problems. But if you cap it with a couple of inches of sand, it prevents that from happening. And it also allows that deeper level to begin breaking down, to become anaerobic. You know, so there, there are so many battles we're fighting with this policy. The notion that somehow anaerobics are bad is is a bad idea yeah well for years they've been trying to sell us a sterile aquarium you know and it's yeah, not right. a sterile place you want it to have as many different kinds of bacteria as it can stand yeah that's exactly right yeah monoculture monocultures monocultures are a big part of why we have fires on land too you know right when you get right. giant fields of grasses and things corn uh that'll burn easily but I mean, in the, in your aquarium, you know, cyanobacteria, it's a monoculture or any right. big growth you're seeing or bloom is usually a monoculture. And so I tell people, like, that, that stop really putting... That really is inevitable in a brand new tank. Yeah. The, the, the trick is to let it go through the cycle and let that second culture begin to come up and compete with the first one. And before long, you've got all kinds of things competing with each other and that's where you get a healthy tank yeah well and I, I think too that um you know a lot of people like to add quick solutions in a bottle rather than wait a week or two yeah and a lot right. of problem a lot of problems as long as your fish aren't sick and dying are aesthetic they're not really problems yeah. you know they it just people don't they want their fish tank to look like a, a postcard and they don't yeah. always do that <laughs> well you know that's that's really true they, they really are i think those two different approaches to fish keeping one is the high aesthetic um the the um the artistic the artistic structure that that really focusing on is focusing on uh, a kind of a a kind of a, a sterile beauty 
that 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 is sustainable somehow long term. Except right. except it isn't. You know, <laughs> in a few months it's over the hill. And as a result, people who do those kinds of tanks tend to break them down in six months to a year and do a new one because you can't you can't maintain it you know it's interesting you say that because um over on my channel we just had a um i threw an aquascaping contest for aquariums yeah and and a third of the points were for how it would grow into itself rather yeah. than just having a good picture for one day a third of the points were how the plants would grow in, how hard maintenance would be, and how happy the fish would be, how the biodiversity, the cleanup team, all that kind of stuff factored in. So I, I, I'm i big for pushing on realistic. I mean, I think it's cool to see what people can do when they push the limits in the hobby. But I also think there's a lot of value in incorporating like the, uh, the Takashi Amano type aquarium with you know uh diane wallstead's method you know some yeah, like exactly. a mix between the two yeah and i agree with you and i i really believe that there's a difference between a mono and and the kind of high-tech stuff that wins awards i don't think they're the same thing i think a mono was really doing a wallstead kind of tank because True. he was creating, he was creating systems that that he was deliberately seeding uh, nourishment into his tanks. Green Machine did the same thing. Yeah, they're using. In fact, he became wealthy. Amanu did. Then yeah. selling these selling these products that he packaged that that were supplements. That he put in the bottom of the tank before uh, even putting the substrates in, and, yeah. and that's, that's pure wall step. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, just while I had it here, if, if I could, is that um, what's her name? Um, uh, <laughs> Crystal Castleman has a new book out. I don't know if you've seen this yet. No, I have not. So it's called. Uh, let's see here. It's called Aquarium Plant. Wait, uh, Aquarium Plants. But it. Let's see if I can open it and. Sh it's it's a thousand species. Wow. And it's all color photos. Wow, with a lot of description. A ton, and it's got pictures of, you know, everything being harvested in the wild, how it grows, immersed and submerged. Oh, wow. Uh, oh. Pictures of it flowering, and then everything we know about the. I mean, it's really the best book I've ever come across, and it just it just came out in Germany. Um, but but uh, she just made this English version, and you can get it on her website. So I mean, I'm not obviously I'm not making any money or anything off of it, but it's just a really great resource. So have you got her website? Um. I think if you Google it, if you just Google Crystal Castleman, you might find it. Because um, that's what I, I did. Is I just Googled it. Um, her name is spelled a little differently than in, in, in America, typically. But uh, C-H-R-I-S-T-E-L. So Crystal and then uh, K-A-S-S-E-L-M-A-N-N. -S -S -E and it's called Aquarium Plants. She has an older version of the book that you can find on Amazon, but this one is literally twice as, as big, and it's all up to date. It's got all the interesting, you know, pink panther, pink flamingo, all the all the interesting varietals of wow. of crips and and uh, aquascaping plants. But the nice thing about it too is it has um, like all the aponic eatons and crips. It has them flowering so that you can really see the species rather than in the aquatic or the uh, submerged form, you can't always tell some of them apart. So, yeah, right. Nice. Yeah, I will be sure to get that. That's exciting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. 
pretty cool research. She's she's worked on it for uh, twenty seven years. She said so. Wow, I will bet. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I hope you found something you've never seen before. Have a great day. Nice having with us. Come on back. <laughs>